Chapter Fifteen of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gaudy hangings of purple cut the light of the sun to a rich gloom in the enormous high vaulted audience hall. A rustling murmur was audible in the room as uneasy courtiers and supplicants fidgeted, waiting for the appearance of the owner. It had been two months since Gope had explained to me how a formal challenge to an owner was conducted, and, as he pointed out, this was the only kind of challenge that would help. If I waylaid the man and cut him down, even in a fair fight, his bodyguards would repay the favor before I could establish the claim that I was their legitimate new boss. I had spent three hours every day in the armory at Rathgallion, trading buffets with Gope and a couple of the bodyguards. The thirty-pound slab of edged steel had felt right at home in my hand that first day, for about a minute. I had the borrowed knowledge to give me all the technique I needed, but the muscle power for putting the knowledge into practice was another matter. After five minutes I was slumped against the wall, gulping air, while Gope whistled his sticker around my head and talked. You laid on like no piper, good Durgan, yet you have much to learn in the matter of endurance. And he was at me again. I spent the afternoon backpedaling and making two-handed swings, and finally fell down, pooped. I couldn't have moved if Gope had had it in me with a hot poker. Gope and the others laughed till they cried, then hauled me away to my room and let me sleep. They rolled me out the next morning to go at it again. As Gope said, there was no time to waste, and after two months of it I felt ready for anything. Gope had warned me that Owner Cooey was a big fellow, but that didn't bother me. The bigger they came, the bigger the target. There was a murmur in a different key in the audience hall, and tall gilt doors opened at the far side of the room. A couple of liveried flunkies scampered into view. Then a seven-foot man-eater stalked into the hall, made his way to the dais, turned to face the crowd. He was enormous. His neck was as thick as my thigh, his features chipped out of granite, the gray variety. He threw back his brilliant purple cloak from his shoulders and reached out an arm like an oak root for the ceremonial sword one of the flunkies was struggling with. He took the sword with its sheath, sat down, and stood it between his feet, his arms folded on top. "'Who has a grievance?' he spoke. The voice reverberated like the old Wurlitzer at the Rialto back home. This was my cue. There he was, just asking for it. All I had to do was speak up. Owner Cooey would gladly oblige me. The fact that next to him Primo Carnera would look dainty shouldn't slow me down. I cleared my throat with a thin squeak and edged forward, not very far. I have one little item, I started. Nobody was listening. Up front, a big fellow in a black toga was pushing through the crowd. Everybody turned to stare at him. There was a craning of necks. The crowd drew back from the dais, leaving an opening. The man in black stepped into the clear, flung back the flapping garment from his right arm, and whipped out a long polished length of razor-edged iron. It was beginning to look like somebody had beaten me to the punch. The newcomer stood there in front of Cooey, with the naked blade making all the threat that was needed. Cooey stared at him for a long moment, then stood, gestured to a flunky. The flunky turned, cleared his throat. <clears throat> the place of Bar Ponderone has been claimed, he recited in a shrill voice. Let the issue be joined. He skittered out of the way, and Cooey rose, threw aside his purple cloak and cowl, and stepped down. I pushed forward to get a better look. The challenger in black tossed his loose garment aside, stood facing Cooey in a skin-tight jerkin and hose. Heavy moccasins of soft leather were laced up the calf. He was magnificently muscled, but Cooey towered over him like a tree, 
with a build that would have taken the Mr. Muscle Beach title any time he cared to try for it. I didn't know whether to be glad or sad that the initiative had been taken out from under me. If the man in black won, I wondered would I then be able to step in and in turn take him on? He was a lot smaller than Cooey, but there was always the chance. Cooey unsheathed his fancy iron and whirled it like it was a lady's putter. I felt sorry for the smaller man, who was just standing, watching him. He really didn't have a chance. I had got through to the fore-rank by now. The challenger turned and I saw his face. I stopped dead, while the fire-bells clanged in my head. The man in black was Foster. In dead silence, Cooey and Foster squared off, touched their sword-points to the floor in some kind of salute, and Cooey's slicer whipped up in a vicious cut. Foster leaned aside, just far enough, then countered with a flick that made Cooey jump back. I let out a long breath and tried swallowing. Foster was like a terrier up against a bull, but it didn't seem to bother him, only me. I had come light years to find him, just in time to see him get his head lopped off. Cooey's blade flashed, cutting at Foster's head. Foster hardly moved. Almost effortlessly, it seemed, he interposed his heavy weapon between the attacking steel and himself. Clash! Clang! Cooey hacked and chopped, and Foster played with him. Then Foster's arm flashed out and there was blood on Cooey's wrist. A gasp went up from the crowd. Now Foster took a step forward, struck, and faltered. In an instant Cooey was on him, and the two men were locked, chest to chest. For a moment Foster held, then Cooey's weight told, and Foster reeled back. He tried to bring up the sword, seemed to struggle, then Cooey lashed out again. Foster twisted, took the blow awkwardly just above the handguard, stumbled, and fell. Cooey leaped to him, raised the sword. I hauled mine halfway out of its sheath and pushed forward. "'Let the man be put away from my sight,' rumbled Cooey. He lowered his immense sword, turned, pushed aside a flunky who had bustled up with a wad of bandages. As he strode from the room, a swarm of bodyguards fanned out between the crowd and Foster. I could see him clumsily struggling to rise. Then I was shoved back, still craning for a glimpse. There was something wrong here. Foster had acted like a man suddenly half paralyzed. Had Cooey doped him in some way? The cordon stopped pushing, turned their backs to the crowd. I tugged at the arm of the man beside me. Did you see anything strange there? I started. He pulled free. Strange, yeah. The mercy of our Lord Cooey. Instead of meeting out death on the spot, our owner was generous. I mean about the fight. I grabbed his arm again to keep him from moving off. That the impudent rascal would dare to claim the place of owner at Bar Ponderone, there's wonder enough for any man, he snapped. Unhand me, fellow. I unhanded him and tried to collect my wits. What now? I tapped a bodyguard on the shoulder. He whirled, club in hand. What's to be the fate of the man? I asked. Like the boss said, they're going to immure the bum for his pains. You mean wall him up? Yeah, just a peephole to pass chow in every day, so as he don't starve, see? The bodyguard chuckled. How long? He'll last. Don't worry. After the change, owner Cooey's got a new man. Shut up, another bruiser said. The crowd was slowly thinning. The bodyguards were relaxing, standing in pairs, talking. Two servants moved about where the fight had taken place, making mystical motions in the air above the floor. I edged forward, watching them. They seemed to be plucking imaginary flowers. Strange. I moved even farther forward to take a closer look, then saw a tiny glint. A servant hurried across, made gestures. I pushed him aside, groped, and my fingers encountered a delicate filament of wire. 
I pulled it in, swept up more. The servants had stopped and stood watching me, muttering. The whole area of the combat was covered with the invisible wires, looping up in coils two feet high. No wonder Foster had stumbled, had trouble raising his sword. He had been netted, encased in a mesh of incredibly fine, tough wire. And in the dim light, even the crowd twenty feet away hadn't seen it. Owner Cooey was a good man with the chopper, but he didn't rely on that alone to hold on to his job. I put my hand on my sword hilt, chewed my lower lip. I had found Foster, but it wouldn't do me, or Valen, much good. He was on his way to the dungeons, to be walled up until the next change, and it would be three months before I could legally make another try for Cooey's place. After seeing him in action, I was glad I hadn't tried today. He wouldn't have needed any net to handle me. I would have to spend the next three months working on my sword play and hope Foster could hold out. Maybe I could sneak a message. A heavy blow on the back sent me spinning. Four bodyguards moved to ring me in, clubs in hand. They were strangers to me, but across the room I saw Torbu looming, looking my way. I saw him. He started to pull that fancy sword, said one of the guards. He was asking me questions. Unbuckle it and drop it, another ordered me. Don't try anything. What's this all about, I said. I have a right to wear a ceremonial sword at an audience. Move in, boys. The four men stepped toward me. The clubs came up. I warded off a smashing blow with my left arm, took a blinding crack across the face, felt myself going down. Another blow, and another, killing ones. Then I was aware of being dragged, endlessly, of voices barking sharp questions, of pain. After a long time it was dark, and silent, and I slept. I groaned, and the sound was dead, muffled. I put out a hand and touched stone on my right. My left elbow touched stone. I made an instinctive move to sit up and smack my head against more stone. My new room was confining. Gingerly I felt my face, and winced at the touch. The bridge of my nose felt different. It was lower than it used to be, in spite of the swelling. I lay back and traced the pattern of pain. There was the nose, smashed flat, with secondary aches around the eyes. They'd be beautiful shiners if I could see them. Now the left arm. It was curled close to my side, and when I moved it I saw why. It wasn't broken, but the shoulder wasn't right, and there was a deep bruise above the elbow. My knees and shin, as far as I could reach, were caked with dried blood. That figured, I remembered being dragged. I tried deep breathing. My chest seemed to be okay. My hands worked. My teeth were in place. Maybe I wasn't as sick as I felt. But where the hell was I? The floor was hard, cold. I needed a big soft bed and a little soft nurse and a hot meal and a cold drink. Foster! I cracked my head again and flopped back, groaned some more. It still sounded pretty dead. I swallowed, licked my lips, felt a nice split that ran well into the bristles. I had attended the audience clean-shaven. Quite a few hours must have passed since then. They had taken Foster away to immure him, somebody said. Then the guards had tapped me, worked me over. Immured! I got a third crack on the head. Suddenly it was hard to breathe. I was walled up, sealed away from the light buried under the foundations of the giant towers of Bar Ponderone. I felt their crushing weight. I forced myself to relax, breathe deep. Being immured wasn't the same as being buried alive. Not exactly. This was the method these latter-day Valonians had figured out to end a man's life effectively without ending all his lives. They figured to keep me neatly packaged here until my next change, thus acquiring another healthy new man for the kitchen or the stables. 
They didn't know the only change that would happen to me was death. They'd have to feed me. That meant a hole. I ran my fingers along the rough stone, found an eight-inch square opening on the left wall just under the ceiling. I reached through it, felt nothing but the solidness of its thick sides. How thick the wall was, I had no way of determining. I was feeling dizzy. I lay back and tried to think. I was awake again. There had been a sound. I moved and felt something hit my chest. I groped for it. It was a small loaf of hard bread. I heard the sound again, and a second object thumped against me. Hey! I yelled. Listen to me. I'll die in here. I'm not like the rest of you. I won't go through a change. I'll rot here till I die. I listened. The silence was absolute. Answer me! I screamed. You're making a mistake. I gave up when my throat got raw. The people who dropped the bread through the little holes to the prisoners had heard a lot of yelling in their time. They didn't listen any more. I felt for the other item that had been pushed in to me. It was a water bottle made of tough plastic. I fumbled the cap off, took a swallow. It wasn't good. I tried the bread. It was tough, tasteless. I lay and chewed and wondered what I was supposed to do about toilet facilities. It was an interesting problem. I could see it was going to be a great life while it lasted. I laughed, a weak snort of despair. As a world saver, I was a bust. I hadn't even been able to get around to bailing out my pal Foster after Cooey had booby-trapped him. I wondered where he was now. Scaled up in the next cubbyhole, probably. But he hadn't answered my yells. Yeah, mine had been a great idea, but it hadn't worked out. I had come a long, long way, and now I was going to die in this reeking hole. I had a sudden vision of stakes uneaten and life unlived. I would have been good for another few decades, anyway. And then I had another thought. If I never had them, was it going to be because I hadn't tried? Abruptly I was planning. I would keep calm and use my head. I wouldn't wear myself out with screams and struggles. I'd figure the angles, use everything I had to make the best try I could. First to explore the tomb-like cell. It hurt to move, but that didn't matter. I felt over the walls, estimating size. My chamber was three feet wide, two feet high, and seven feet long. The walls were relatively smooth, except for a few mortar joints. The stones were big, eighteen inches or so by a couple of feet. I scratched at the mortar. It was rock hard. I wondered how they'd gotten me in. Some of the stones must be newly placed, or else there was a door. I couldn't feel anything as far as my hands would reach. Maybe at the other end. I tried to twist around. No go. The people who had built the cage knew just how to dimension it to keep the occupant oriented the way they wanted him. He was supposed to just lie quietly and wait for the bread and water to fall through the hole above his chest. That was reason enough to change positions. If they wanted me to stay put, I'd at least have the pleasure of defying the rules. And there just might be a reason why they didn't want me moving around. I turned on my side, pulled my legs up, hugged them to my chest, worked my way down, and jammed. My skin, knees, and shins didn't help any. I inched them higher, wincing at the pain, then braced my hands against the floor and roof and forced my torso toward my feet. Still no go. The rough stone was shredding my back. I moved my knees apart. That eased the pressure a little. I made another inch. I rested tried to get some air. It wasn't easy. My chest was crushed between my thighs and the stone wall at my back. I breathed shallowly, wondering whether I should go back or try to push on. I tried to move my legs. They didn't like the idea. I might as well go on. It would be no fun either way, and if I waited I'd stiffen up, while inactivity and no food and loss of blood would weaken me further every moment. I wouldn't do better next time. Not even as well. 
This was the time. Now. I set myself, pushed again. I didn't move. I pushed harder, scraping my palms raw against the stone. I was stuck. Good. I went limp suddenly. Then I panicked, in the grip of claustrophobia. I snarled, rammed my hands hard against the floor and wall, and heaved, and felt my lacerated back slip along the stone, sliding on a lubricating film of blood. I pushed again. My back curved, doubled. My knees were forced up beside my ears. I couldn't breathe at all now, and my spine was breaking. It didn't matter. I might as well break it, rip off all the hide, bleed to death. I had nothing to lose. I shoved again, felt the back of my head grate, my neck bent, creaking. Then I was through, stretching out the flop on my back, gasping, my head where my feet had been. Score one for our side. It took a long time to get my breath back and sort out my various abrasions. My back was worst, then my legs and hands. There was a messy spot on the back of my head, and sharp pains shut down my spine, and I was getting tired of breathing through my mouth instead of my smashed nose. Other than that, I'd never felt better in my life. I had plenty of room to relax in. I could breathe. All I had to do was rest, and after a while they dropped some more nice bread and water into me. I shook myself awake. There was something about the absolute darkness and silence that made my mind want to curl up and sleep, but there was no time for that. If there had been a stone freshly set in mortar to seal the chamber after I had been stuffed inside, this was the time to find it, before it set too hard. I ran my hands over the wall, found the joints. The mortar was dry and hard in the first. In the next, under my fingernail, soft mortar crumbled away. I traced the joint. It ran around a twelve by eighteen inch stone. I raised myself on my elbows, settled down to scratching at it. Half an hour later I had ten bloody tips and a half inch groove dug out around the stone. It was slow work, and I couldn't go much farther without a tool of some sort. I felt for the water bottle, took off the cap, tried to crush it. It wouldn't crush. There was nothing else in the cell. Maybe the stone would move, mortar and all, if I shoved hard enough. I set my feet against the end wall, my hands against the block, and strained until the blood roared in my ears. No use. It was planted as solid as a mother-in-law in the spare bedroom. I was lying there, just thinking about it, when I became aware of something. It wasn't a noise, exactly. It was more like a fourth-dimensional sound heard inside the brain, or the memory of one. But my next sensation was perfectly real. I felt four little feet walking gravely up my belly toward my chin. It was my cat, Itzenka. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Trace of Memory. Chapter 16 For a while, I toyed with the idea of just chalking it up as a miracle. Then I decided it would be a nice problem in probabilities. It had been seven months since we had parted company on the pink terrace at Ock Hameloth. Where would I have gone if I had been a cat? And how could I have found me, my old pal from Earth? Itzinka exhaled a snuffle in my ear. Come to think of it, the stink is pretty strong, isn't it? I guess there's nobody on Valen with quite the same heady fragrance. And what with the close quarters here, the concentration of sweat, blood, and you name it, must be pretty penetrating. It didn't seem to care. She marched around my head and back again, now and then laid a tentative paw on my nose or chin, and kept up a steady rumbling purr. The feeling of affection I had for that cat right then was close to being one of my life's grand passions. 
My hands roamed over her scrawny frame, fingered again the calfite collar I had whiled away an hour in fashioning for her aboard the lifeboat. My head hit the stone wall with a crack I didn't even notice. In ten seconds I had released the collar clasp, pulled the collar from Itsenka's neck, thumbed the stiff calfite out into a blade about ten inches long, and was scraping at the mortar beyond my head at fever heat. They had fed me three times by the time the groove was nine inches deep on all sides of the block, and the mortar had hardened. But I was nearly through, I figured. I took a rest, then made another try at loosening the block. I thrust the blade into the slot, levered gently at the stone. If it was only supported on one edge now, as it would be if it were a little less than a foot thick, it should be about ready to go. I couldn't tell. I put down my scraper, got into position, and pushed. I wasn't as strong as I had been. There wasn't much force in the push. Again I rested, and again I tried. Maybe there was only a thin crust of mortar still holding. Maybe one more ounce of pressure would do it. I took a deep breath, strained, and felt the block shift minutely. Now I heaved again, teeth gritted, drew back my feet, and thrust hard. The stone slid out with a grating sound, dropped half an inch. I paused to listen. All quiet. I shoved again, and the stone dropped with a heavy thud to the floor outside. With no loss of time I pushed through behind it, felt a breath of cooler air, got my shoulders free, pulled my legs through, and stood for the first time in how many days. I had already figured my next move. As soon as Itsenka had stepped out I reached back in, groped for the water bottle, the dry crusts I had been saving, and the wad of bread paste I had made up. I reached a second time for a handful of the powdered mortar I had produced, then lifted the stone. I settled it in place, using the hard bread as supports, then packed the open joint with gummy bread. I dusted it over with dry mortar, then carefully swept up the debris, as well as I could in the total darkness. The bread and water man would have a light and he was due in half an hour or so, as closely as I had been able to estimate the time of his regular round. I didn't want him to see anything out of the ordinary. I was counting on finding Foster filed away somewhere in the stacks, and I need time to try to release him. I moved along the corridor, counting my steps, one handful of breadcrumbs and stone dust, the other feeling the wall. There were narrow side branches every few feet, the access ways to the feeding holes. Forty-one paces from my slot I came to a wooden door. It wasn't locked, but I didn't open it. I wasn't ready to use it yet. I went back, passed my hole, continued nine paces to a blank wall. Then I tried the side branches. They were all seven-foot stubs, dead ends. Each had the eight-inch holes on either side. I called Foster's name softly at each hole, but there was no answer. I heard no signs of life, no yells or heavy breathing. Was I the only one here? That wasn't what I had figured on. Foster had to be in one of these delightful bedrooms. I had come across the universe to see him and I wasn't going to leave Bar Pondrone without him. It was time to get ready for the bread man. I had a choice of trying to get back into my hole and replacing the block, or of hiding in one of the side branches. I thought it over for a couple of microseconds and decided against getting back in my tomb. If there were as many vacancies here as I guessed, I'd be safe in any one of the side passages but my own. I groped my way into a convenient hidey hole, Itsenka at my heels. With half a year's experience at dodging humans behind her, she could be trusted not to show at the crucial moment, I figured. I had just jettisoned my handful of trash in the backmost corner of the passage when there was a soft grating sound from the door. I flattened myself against the wall. I'd know in a second or two how observant the keeper was. A light splashed on the floor. It must have been dim but seemed to my eyes like the blaze of noon. Soft footsteps sounded. I held my breath. A man in bodyguard's trappings, basket in hand, moved past the entry of the branch where I stood, went on. I breathed again. 
Now all I had to do was keep an eye on the feeder, watch where he stopped. I stepped to the corridor, risked a glance, saw him entering a branch far down the corridor. As he disappeared, I made it three branches farther along, ducked out of sight. I heard him coming back. I flattened myself. He went by me, opened the door. It closed behind him, and the darkness and silence settled down once more. I stood where I was, feeling like a guy who's just showed up for a party, on the wrong day. The bread man had stopped at one cell only. Mine. Foster wasn't here. It was a long wait for the next feeding, but I put the time to use. First, I had a good nap. I had been getting my rest while I scratched my way out of my nest. I woke up feeling better and started thinking about the next move. The bodyguard who brought the food was the first item. I had had to get a set of clothes somewhere, and he'd be the easiest source to tap. If my mental clock was right, it was about time. The door creaked, and I did a fast fade down a side branch. The guard shuffled into view. Now was the time. I moved out, quietly, I thought, and he whirled, dropped the load and bottle, and fumbled at his club hilt. I didn't have a club to slow me down. I went at him, threw a beautiful right, square to the mouth. He went over backwards, with me on top. I heard his head hit with a sound like a length of rubber hose slapping a grapefruit. He didn't move. I pulled the clothes off him, struggled into them. They didn't fit too well, and they probably smelled gamey to anybody who hadn't spent a week where I had, but details like those didn't count any more. I tore his sash into strips and tied him. He wasn't dead, quite, but I had reason to know that any yelling he did was unlikely to attract much attention. I hoped he'd enjoy the rest and quiet until the next feeding time. By then I expected to be long gone. I lifted the door open and stepped out into a dimly lit corridor. With its Senka abreast of me I moved along in absolute stillness, passed a side corridor, came to a heavy door. Locked. We retraced our steps, went down the side hall, found a flight of worn steps, followed them up two flights and emerged in a dark room. A line of light showed around a door. I went to it, peered through the crack. Two men in stained kitchen-slave tunics fussed over a boiling cauldron. I pushed through the door. The two looked up, startled. I rounded a littered table, grabbed up a heavy soup-ladle, and sculled the nearest cook just as he opened up to yell. The other one, a big fellow, went for a cleaver. I caught him in two jumps, laid him out cold beside his pal. I found an apron, ripped it up, and tied and gagged the two slaves then hauled them into a storeroom. I was stacking Valonians away like a squirrel storing nuts. I came back into the kitchen. It was silent now. The room reeked of sour soup. A stack of unpleasantly familiar loaves stood by the oven. I gave them a kick that collapsed the pile as I passed to pick up a knife. I hacked tough slices from a cold haunch of Valonian mutton, threw one to its anchor across the table, and sat and gnawed the meat while I tried to think through my plans. Owner Cooey was a big man to tackle, but he was the one with the answers. If I could make my way to his apartment, and if I wasn't stopped before I'd forced the truth out of him, then I might get to Foster and tell him that if he had the memory playback machine, I had the memory, if it hadn't been filched from the bottom of a knapsack aboard a lifeboat parked at Ock Hameloth. Four ifs and a might. But it was something to shoot at. My first move would be to locate Cooey's quarters, somewhere here in the palace, and get inside. My bodyguard's outfit was as good a disguise as any for the attempt. I finished off my share of the meat and got to my feet. I'd have to find a place to clean myself up, shave. The rear door banged open, and two bodyguards came through it, talking loudly, laughing. Hey, cook! Set out meat for—' The heavy in the lead stopped short, gaping at me. I gaped back. It was Torbu. "'Durgon, how did you—' he trailed off. The other bodyguard came past him, looked me over. "'You're no brother of the guard,' he started. 
I reached for the cleaver the kitchen slave had left on the table, backed against a tall wall cupboard. The bodyguard unlimbered his club. "'Hold it, Blon,' said Torbu. "'Durgon's okay.' He looked at me. "'I kind of figured you for done for, Durgon. The boys worked you over pretty good.' "'Yeah,' I returned. "'And thanks for your help in stopping it.' This is the miscreant we immured! Blon bursts out. Take him! Torbu shifted. Hold it a minute, he said. He looked uncomfortable. Listen, you two, I said. You claim to believe in the system around here. You think it's a great life, all fair play and no holds barred and plenty of goodies for the winner. I know, it was tough about Kagu, but that's life, isn't it? But what about the business I saw in that audience hall? You guys try not to think about that angle, is that it?" "'The noble owner's got a right,' Blonde started. "'I didn't like the caper with the wires, Blonde,' said Torbu. "'You didn't either. Neither did most of the boys.' "'And I don't remember getting much of a show myself,' I said. "'There are a couple of your buddies I plan to look up when I have some free time.' I didn't lay a hand on you, Durgon," said Torbu. I didn't want no part of that. It was the owner's orders, said Blon. What was I going to do? Tell him? Never mind, I said. I'll tell him myself. That's all I want. Just a short interview with the owner, minus the wire nets. Wow, drawled Torbu. Yeah, that'd be about. He turned to Blon. This guy's got a punch, Blon. He don't look so hot, but he could swap buffets with the fire durgun he's named after. If he's that good with a long blade... Just lend me one, I said, and show me the way to his apartment. The noble owner'll cut this clown to ribbons in two minutes flat, said Blon. Let's get the boys. How could we explain it afterwards to the noble owner, said Blon. He ain't gonna think much of guys he thought was immured, nice and safe, turning up in his bedchamber, armed. "'We're brothers of the guard,' said Torbu. "'We ain't got much, but we got our code. And don't say nothing about wires. If we don't back up our oath to the Brotherhood, we ain't no better than slaves.' He turned to me. "'Come on, Durgan. We'll take you to the guard room so you can clean up and put on a good blade. If you're gonna lose all your lives at once—' You want to do it right." Torbu watched as the boys belted and strapped me into a guardsman's fighting outfit. I had made him uneasy, maybe even starting him thinking. If I could last, just those two minutes flat, before owner Cooey killed me, then he'd collect his bet, I'd be out of his hair, and he could go back to being Torbu, a plain tough guy with a code he could still believe in. And if I won... I felt better in the clean trappings of tough leather and steel. Torbu led the way and fifteen bodyguards followed, like a herd of trolls. There were few palace servants out at this hour. Those who saw us gaped from a safe distance and went on about their business. We crossed the empty audience hall, climbed a wide staircase, went along a spacious corridor hung with rich brocades and carpeted in deep pile silk with soft lights glowing around ornate doors. We stopped before a great double door. Two guards in dress purple sauntered over to see what it was all about. Torbu clued them in. They hesitated, looked us over. "'We're going in, rookie,' said Torbu. "'Open up.' They did. I pushed past Torbu into a room whose splendor made Gope's state apartment look like a four-dollar motel. Bright scintillate streamed through tall windows, showed me a wide bed and somebody in it. I went to it, grabbed the bedclothes, and hauled them off onto the floor. Owner Cooey sat up slowly, seven feet of muscle. He looked at me, glanced past me to the foremost of my escort. He was out of the bed like a tiger, coming straight for me. There was no time to fumble with the sword. I went to meet him threw all my weight into a right haymaker and felt it connect. I plunged past, whirled. Cooey was staggering, but still on his feet. I had hit him with everything I had, nearly broken my fist. 
and he was still standing. I couldn't let him rest. I was after him, slammed a hard punch to the kidneys, caught him across the jaw as he turned, drove a left and right into his stomach. A girder fell from the top of the Golden Gate Bridge and shattered every bone in my body. There was a booming like heavy surf, and I was floating in it, dead. Then I was in hell, being prodded by red-hot tridents. I blinked my eyes. The roaring was fading now. I saw Cooey leaning against the foot of the bed, breathing heavily. I had to get him. I got my feet under me, stood up. My chest was caved in and my left arm belonged to somebody else. Okay, I still had my right. I made it over to Cooey, maneuvered into position. He didn't look at me. He seemed to be having trouble breathing. Those gut punches had gotten to him. I picked a spot just behind the right ear, reared back, and threw a trip-hammer punch with my shoulder and legs behind it. I felt the jaw go. Cooey jumped the footboard and piled onto the floor like a hundred-car freight hitting an open switch. I sat down on the edge of the bed and sucked in air, and tried to ignore the whirling lights that were closing in. After a while I noticed Torbu standing in front of me with a cat under one arm. Both of them were grinning at me. "'Any orders, Owner Durgan?' I found my voice. "'Wake him up and prop him in a chair. I want to talk to him.' Ex-Owner Cooey didn't much like the idea, but after Torbu and a couple of other strong-arm lads had explained the situation to him in sign language, he decided to cooperate. Get off his head, Mull, Torbu said, and untwist that rope, Blon. Owner Durgan wants him in a conversational mood. You guys are going to make him feel self-conscious. I had been feeling over my ribs, trying to count how many were broken and how many just bent. Cooey's punch was a lot like the kick of a two-ton ostrich. He was looking at me now, eyes wild. Cooey, I want to ask you a few questions. If I don't like the answers, I'll see if I can't find quarters for you in the basement annex. I just left a cozy room there myself. There's no view to speak of, but it's peaceful." Cooey grunted something. He was having trouble talking around his broken jaw. "'The fellow in black,' I said, "'the one who claimed your place as owner. You netted him and had your bully boys haul him off somewhere. I want to know where.' Cooey grunted again. "'Hit him, Torbu,' I said. "'It will help his enunciation.' Torbu kicked the former owner in the shin. Cooey jumped and glowered at him. "'Call off your dogs,' he mumbled. "'You'll not find the upstart you seek here.' "'Why not? I sent him away.' "'Where?' "'To that place from which you and your turncoat crew will never fetch him back.' Be more specific. Cooey spat. Torbu didn't much like that crack about turncoats, I said. He's eager to show you how little. I advise you to talk fast and plain before you lose a whole raft of lives. Even these swine would never dare. I took out the needle pointed knife I was wearing as part of my get up. I put the point against Cooey's throat and pushed gently until a trickle of crimson ran down the thick neck. "'Talk,' I said quietly, "'or I'll cut your throat myself.' Cooey had shrunk back as far as he could in the heavy chair. "'Seek him, then, assassin,' he sneered. "'Seek him in the dungeons of the owner of owners.' "'Keep talking,' I prompted. The great owner commanded that the slave be brought to him, at the Palace of Sapphires by the Shallow Sea. Has this owner's owner got a name? How'd he hear about him? Lord Amadurid, Cooey's voice grated out. He was watching Torbo's foot. There was that about the person of the stranger that led me to inform him. When did he go? Yesterday. You know this sapphire palace, Torbu? Sure, he answered. But the place is taboo. It's crawling with demons and warlocks. The word is, there's a curse on the... Then I'll go in alone, I said. I put the knife away. But first, 
I've got a call to make at the spaceport at Ak Hamaloth. Sure, Owner Durgan. The port's easy. Some say it's kind of haunted, too, but that's just a gag. The Grey Men hang out there. We can take care of the Grey Men, I said. Get fifty of your best men together and line up some air cars. I want the outfit ready to move out in half an hour. What about this chiseler? asked Torbu. Seal him up until I get back. If I don't make it, I know he'll understand. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of A Trace of Memory by Keith Lawmer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Trace of Memory, Chapter Seventeen. It was not quite dawn when my task force settled down on the smooth landing pad beside the lifeboat that had brought me to Valen. It stood as I had left it seven earth months before, the port open, the access ladder extended, the interior lights lit. There weren't any spooks aboard, but they had kept visitors away as effectively as if there had been. Even the gray men didn't mess with ghost boats. Somebody had done a thorough job of indoctrination on Valen. "'You ain't gonna go inside that accursed vessel, are you, Owner Durgan? asked Torbu, making his cabalistic sign in the air. "'It's manned by goblins!' "'That's just propaganda. Where my cat can go, I can go. Look!' Itsenka scampered up the ladder, and had disappeared inside the boat by the time I took the first rung. The guards gawked from below as I stepped into the softly lit lounge. The black and gold cylinder that was Foster's memory lay in the bag I had packed and left behind, months before. And with it was the other, plain one. Ah, Merrill's memory. Somewhere in Ock Hameloth must be the machine that would give these meaning. Together Foster and I would find it. I found the thirty-eight automatic lying where I had left it. I picked up the worn belt, strapped it around me. My Valonian career to date suggested it would be a bright idea to bring it along. The Valonians had never developed any personal armament to equal it. In a society of immortals knives were considered lethal enough for all ordinary purposes. "'Come on, Cat,' I said. "'There's nothing more here we need.' Back on the ramp I beckoned my platoon leaders over. "'I'm going to the Sapphire Palace,' I said. "'Anybody that doesn't want to go can check out now. Pass the word." Torbu stood silent for a long moment, staring straight ahead. "'I don't like it much, owner,' he said, "'but I'll go, and so will the rest of them.' "'There'll be no backing out once we shove off,' I said. And, by the way, I jacked around into the chamber of the pistol, raised it, and fired the shot into the air. They all jumped. "'If you ever hear that sound, come a-running.' The men nodded, turned to their cars. I picked up the cat and piled into the lead vehicle next to Torbu. "'It's a half-hour run,' he said. "'We might run into a little gray man action on the way. We can handle them. We lifted, swung to the east, barreled along at low altitude. "'What do we do when we get there, boss?' said Torbu. "'We play it by ear.' Let's see how far we can get on Pier Gaul before Amadura drops the hanky." The palace lay below us, rearing blue towers to the twilit sky like a royal residence in the Munchkin country. Beyond it, sunset colors reflected from the silky surface of the shallow sea. The timeless stones and still waters looked much as they had when Foster set out to lose his identity on earth three thousand years before but its magnificence was lost on these people. The hulking crew around me never paused to wonder about the marvels wrought by their immortal ancestors, themselves. Stolidly they lived their feudal lives in dismal contrast with the monuments all about them. I turned to my cohort of hoodlums. "'You boys claim it's the demons and warlocks that keep the whole of Valen at arm's length from this place.' In that case there's no protocol for a new owner's reception at the Blue Palace. A guy with a little luck and even less of a memory than usual 
could skip the goblins and play it good-natured but dumb. Show up at the palace grounds, out of common politeness to the top dog, to pay his respects. Anything wrong with that? What if they rush us first, before we got time to go into the act?" said somebody in the mob. That's where the luck comes in, I said. Anybody else? Torbu looked around at his henchmen. There was some shrugging of shoulders, a few grunts. He looked at me. You do the figure and owner, he said. The boys will back your play. We were dropping toward the wide lawns now and still no opposition showed itself. Then the towering blue spires were looming over us, and we saw men forming up behind the blue-stained steel gates of the great pavilion. A reception committee, I said. Hold tight, fellas. Don't start anything. The further in we get peaceably, the less that leaves to do the hard way. The car settled down gently, well grouped, and Torbu and I climbed out. As quickly as the other boats disgorged their men, ranks were closed, and we moved off toward the gates. Etsenka, as mascot, brought up the rear. Still no excitement, no rush by the palace guards. Had too many centuries of calm made them lackadaisical? Or did Amadurid use a brand of visitor repellent we couldn't see from here? We made it to the gate, and it opened. In we go, I said, but be ready. The uniformed men inside the compound, obviously chosen for their beef content, kept their distance, looking at us questioningly. We pulled up on a broad, blue paved drive and waited for the next move. About now somebody should stride up to us and offer the key to the city, or something. But there seemed to be a hitch. It was understandable. After all, there hadn't been any callers dropping cards here for about twenty-nine hundred years. It was a long five minutes before a hard case in a beetle-backed carapace of armor and a puffy pink cap bustled down the palace steps and came up to us. "'Who comes in force to the Sapphire Palace?' he demanded, glancing past me at my teammates. "'I'm Owner Durgan, fellow,' I barked. "'These are my honor guard. What provincial welcome is this, from the great owner to a loyal liegeman?' That punctured his pomposity a little. He apologized, in a half-hearted way, mumbled something about arrangements, and beckoned over a couple of sidemen. One of them came over and spoke to Torbu, who looked my way, hand on dagger-hilt. What's this? I said. Where I go, my men go. There is the matter of caste, said my pink-caped greeter. Packs of retainers are not ushered en masse into the presence of Lord Omadarad, owner of owners. I thought that one over and failed to come up with a plausible loophole. Okay, Torbu, I said. Keep the boys together and behave yourselves. I'll see you in an hour. Oh, and see that Itsenka gets made comfy." The beetle-man snapped a few orders, then waved me toward the palace with the slightest bow I ever saw. A six-man guard kept me company up the steps and into the great pavilion. I guess I expected the usual velvet-draped audience chamber, or barbarically splendid hall, complete with pipers, fools, and ceremonial guards. What I got was an office, about sixteen by eighteen blue-carpeted and tasteful, but bare-looking. I stopped in front of a block of blue-veined gray marble with a couple of quill pens and a crystal holder, and underneath legroom for a behemoth, who was sitting behind the desk. He got to his feet with all the ponderous mass of Nero Wolf, but a lot more agility and grace. "'You wish?' he rumbled. "'I'm owner Durgan, a uh, great owner,' I said. I'd planned to give my host the friendly but dumb routine. I was going to find the second part of the act easy. There was something about Amadura that made me feel like a mouse who'd just changed his mind about the cheese. Cooey had been big, but this guy could crush skulls as most men pinch peanut hulls, and in his eyes was the kind of remote look that came of three millennia of not even having to mention the power he asserted. You ignore superstition," observed the big owner. He didn't waste many words, it seemed. Gulp had said he was the silent type. It wasn't a bad lead. I decided to follow it. 
Don't believe in him, I said. To your business, then, he continued. Why? Just been chosen owner at Bar Ponderone, I said. Felt it was only fitting that I come and do obeisance before your grace. That expression is not used. Oh! This fellow had a disconcerting way of not getting sucked in. Lord Amadurit? He nodded just perceptibly, then turned to the foremost of the herd who had brought me in. Quarters for the guest and his retinue. His eyes had already withdrawn, like the head of a Galapagos turtle into his enormous shell, in contemplation of eternal verities. I piped up again. Uh, pardon me. The piercing stare of Amadura's eyes was on me again. There was a friend of mine. I gulped. Swill guy, but impulsive. It seems he challenged the former owner of Bar Ponderone. Amadura did no more than twitch an eyebrow, but suddenly the air was electric. His stare didn't waver by a millimeter, but the lazy slouch of the six guards had altered to sprung steel. They hadn't moved, but I felt them now all around me and not a foot away. I had a sinking feeling that I'd gone too far. So I thought maybe I'd crave your excellency's help, if possible, to locate my pal. I finished weakly. For an interminable minute the owner of owners bored into me with his eyes. Then he raised a finger a quarter of an inch. The guards relaxed. Quarters for the guest and his retinue, repeated Amadurid. He withdrew then, without moving. I was dismissed. I went quietly, attended by my hulking escort. I tried hard not to let my expression show any excitement, but I was feeling plenty. Amadurid was close-mouthed for a reason. I was willing to bet that he had his memories of the good time intact. Instead of the debased modern dialect that I'd heard everywhere since my arrival, Amadurid spoke flawless old Valonian. It was twenty-seven o'clock and the Palace of Sapphires was silent. I was alone in the ornate bedchamber the great owner had assigned me. It was a nice room, but I wouldn't learn anything staying in it. Nobody had said I was confined to quarters. I'd do a little scouting and see what I could pick up, if anything. I slung on the holster and the thirty-eight, and slid out of the darkened chamber into the scarcely lighter corridor beyond. I saw a guard at the far end, he ignored me. I headed in the opposite direction. None of the rooms was locked. There was no arsenal at the palace and no archives that lesser folk than the great owner could use with profit. Everything was easy of access. I guessed that Amadurid rightly counted on indifference to keep snoopers away. Here and there guards eyed me as I passed along, but they said nothing. I saw again by Scintillite the office where Amadurid had received me, and near it an ostentatious hall with black onyx floor and ceiling, gold hangings, and ceremonial ring-board. But the center of attraction was the familiar motif of the concentric circles of the two worlds, sketched in beaten gold across the broad wall of black marble behind the throne. Here the idea had been elaborated on. Outer from both the inner and outer circles flamed the waving lines of a sunburst. At dead center a boss, like a sword-hilt in form, chased in black and gold, erupted a foot from the wall. It was the first time I'd seen the symbol since I'd arrived on Valen. I found it strangely exciting like a footprint in the sand. I went on, toured the laundry and inspected pantries large and small, and caught a whiff of stables. The place was asleep. Few of its occupants noticed me, and those who did hung back, silent. It looked as if the great owner had given orders to let me roam freely. Somehow I didn't find that comforting. Then I came into a purple vaulted hall and saw a squad of guards, the same six who'd kept me such close company earlier in the day. They were drawn up at parade rest, three on each side of a massive ivory door. Somebody lived in safety and splendor on the other side. Six sets of hard eyes turned my way. It was too late to duck back out of sight. I trotted up to the first of the row of guards. "'Say, fella,' 
I stage whispered. Where's the, uh, you know? Every bedchamber is equipped, he said gruffly, raising his sword and fingering its tip lovingly. Yeah, I never noticed. I moved off, looking chastened. If they thought I was a cupy, so much the better. I was a mouse in cad country here, and I wasn't ready to fake a meow. Not yet. On the ground floor I found Torbu and his cohort quartered in a barrack room off the main entry hall. "'We're still in enemy territory,' I reminded Torbu. "'I want every man ready.' "'No fear, boss,' said Torbu. "'All my bullies got an eye on the door and a hand on a knife-hilt.' Have you seen or heard anything useful? Nah, these local dullards fall dumb at the first query. Keep your eyes cocked. I want at least two men awake and on the alert all night. You bet, noble Durgan. I judged distances carefully as I went back up the two flights to my own room. Inside I dropped into a brocaded easy chair and tried to add up what I'd seen. First. Amadur's apartment, as nearly as I could judge, was directly over my own, two floors up. That was a break, or maybe I was where I was for easier surveillance. I'd skip that angle, I decided. It tended to discourage me and I needed all the enthusiasm I could generate. Second, I wasn't going to learn anything useful trotting around corridors. Amadur wasn't the kind to leave traces of skullduggery lying around where the guests would see them. And third, I should have known better than to hit this fortress with two squads and a thirty-eight in the first place. Foster was here. Cooey had said so, and the great owner's reaction to my mention of him confirmed it. What was it about Foster, anyway, that made him so interesting to these top people? I'd have to ask him that one when I found him. But to do that, I'd have to leave the beaten track. I went to the wide double window and looked up. A cloud swept from the great three-quarters face of Sinti, blue in the southern sky, and I could see an elaborately carved façade ranging up past a row of windows above my own to a railed balcony bathed in a pale light from the apartment within. If my calculations were correct, that would be Amadurid's digs. The front door was guarded like an octogenarian's harem, but the back way looked like a breeze. I pulled my head back in and thought about it. It was risky, but it had that element of the unexpected that just might let me get away with it. Tomorrow the owner of owners might have thought it through and switched me to another room, or to a cell in the basement. Then too, wall scaling didn't occur to these Valonians as readily as it did to a short timer from Earth. They had too much to lose to risk it on a chancy climb. Too much thinking is never a good idea when your pulse is telling you it's time for action. I rolled a heavy armoire fairly soundlessly over the deep pile carpet and lodged it against the door. That might slow down a casual caller. I slipped the magazine out of the automatic, fitted nine greasy brass cartridges into it, slammed it home, dropped the pistol back in the holster. It had a comforting weight. I buttoned the strap over it and went back to the window. The clouds were back across Sinti's floodlight. That would help. I stepped out. The deep carving gave me easy handholds, and I made it to the next window sill without even working up a light sweat. Compared with my last climb, back in Lima, this was a cinch. I rested a moment, then clambered around the dark window, just in case there was an insomniac on the other side of the glass, and went on up. I reached the balcony had a hairy moment as I groped outward for a hold on the smooth floor tiling above, and then I was pulling up and over the ornamental ironwork. The balcony was narrow, about twenty feet long, giving on half a dozen tall glass doors. Three showed light behind heavy draperies, three were dark. I moved close, tried to see something past the edge of the draperies. No go. I put an ear to the glass thought maybe I heard a sound, like a distant volcano. That would be Amadurid's bass rumble. The bear was in his cave. I went along to the dark doors and on impulse tried a handle. It turned and the door swung in soundlessly. 
I felt my pulse pick up a double-time beat. I stood peering past the edge of the door into the ink-black interior. It didn't look inviting. In fact, it looked repellent. Even a country boy like me could see that to step into the dragon's den without even a zippo to spot the footstools with would be the act of a nitwit. I swallowed hard, got a firm grip on my pistol, and went in. A soft fold of drapery brushed my face, and I had the pistol out and my back to the wall with a speed that would have made Earp faint with envy. My adrenals gave a couple of wild jumps, and my nervous system followed with a variety of sensations, none pleasant. It took me a minute to get my Adam's apple swallowed again, and remind myself that I was a rough, tough son of a gun from the planet Earth who had parleyed one short life into more trouble than most Valonians managed in half of eternity. And I was on my way to get my pal Foster out of a tight spot, hand him back his memory, and set the two worlds back on the rails they had fallen off of about six hundred years before Alexander started looking around for his first rumble. I stopped before I got so confident I charged into the next room and challenged Amadura to wrestle, two falls out of three. I could hear his voice better now, muttering beyond the partition. If I could make out what he was saying. I edged along the wall, found a heavy door, closed and locked. No help there. I felt my way further, found another door. Delicately I tried the handle, eased it open a crack. A closet, half filled with racked garments. But I could hear more clearly now. Maybe it was a double closet with communicating doors both to the room I was in and to the next one, where the great owner was still rambling on. Apparently something had overcome his aversion to talking. There were pauses that must have been filled in by the replies of somebody else, who didn't have the vocal timbre Omadurid did. I felt my way through the hanging clothing, felt over the closet walls. I was out of luck. There was no other door. I put an ear to the wall. I could catch an occasional word. Ring. Ach Hameloth. Vaults. It sounded like something I'd like to hear more about. How could I get closer? On impulse I reached up, touched a low ceiling, and felt a ridge like the trim around an access panel to a crawl space. I crossed my fingers, stood on tiptoe to push at the panel. Nothing moved. I felt around in the dark encountered a low shelf covered with shoes. I investigated it. It was movable. I eased it aside a foot or two, piled the shoes on the floor, and stepped up. The panel was two feet long on a side, with no discernible hinges or catch. I pushed some more, then gritted my teeth and heaved. There was a startlingly loud crack, and the panel lifted. I blinked away the dust that settled in my eyes, reached to feel around within the opening, touch nothing but rough floorboards. This would be an excellent time, I reflected, to back out of here, get a few hours sleep, and tomorrow bid Amadurid a hearty farewell. Then in a few months, after I had had time to organize my new estate and align a few supporting owners, I could come back in force. I cocked my head, listening. Amadurid had stopped talking and another voice said something. Then there was a heavy thump, the clump of feet, and a metallic sound. After a moment the great owner's voice came again, and the other voice answered. I stretched, grabbed the edge of the opening and pulled myself up. I leaned forward, got a leg up, and rolled silently onto the rough floor. Feeling my way I crawled, felt a wall rising, followed it, turned a corner. The voices were louder, quite suddenly. I saw why. There was a ventilating register ahead, gridded light gleaming through it. I crept along to the opening, lay flat, peered through it, and saw three men. Amadurid was standing with his back to me, a giant figure swathed to the eyes in purple robes. Beside him, a lean redhead, with a leg that had been broken and badly set, stood round-shouldered, teeth bared in an eager grimace clutching a rod of office. The third man was Foster. Foster stood, 
legs braced apart as though to withstand an earthquake, hands manacled before him. He looked steadily at the redhead, like a man marking a tree for cutting. "'I know nothing of these crimes,' he said. Amadura turned, swept out of sight. The redhead motioned. Foster turned away, moving stiffly, passed from my view. I heard a door open and close. I lay where I was and tried to sort out half a dozen conflicting impulses that clamored for attention. A few were easy. It wouldn't help matters to yell, Stop thief! or to fall through the register and chase after Foster with loud cries of joy. It wouldn't be much better to scramble out, dash downstairs, and turn out my bodyguards to raid Amadurid's apartment. What might do some good was to gather more information. It had been bad luck that I had arrived at my peephole a few minutes too late to hear what the interview had been all about, but I might still make use of my advantage. I felt over the register, found fasteners at the corners. They lifted easily and the metal grating tilted back into my hands. I laid it aside, poked my head out. The room was empty as far as I could see. It was time to take a few chances. I reversed my position led my legs through the opening and dropped softly to the floor. I reached back up and managed to prop the grating in position, just in case. It was a fancy chamber, hung in purple and furnished for a king. I poked through the pigeonholes of a secretary, opened a few cupboards, peered under the bed. It looked like I wasn't going to find any useful clues lying around loose. I went to the glass doors to the balcony unlocked one and left it ajar, in case I wanted to leave in a hurry. There was another door across the room. I went over and tried it. Locked. That gave me something definite to look for. A key. I rummaged some more in the secretary, then tried the drawer in a small table beside a broad couch and came up with a nice little steel key that looked like maybe... I tried it. It was. Luck was still coming my way. I pushed open the door, saw a dark room beyond. I felt for a light switch, flicked it on, pushed the door shut behind me. The room looked like the popular idea of a necromancer's study. The windowless walls were lined with shelves packed closely with books. The high, black-draped ceiling hung like a hovering bat above the ramparted floor of bare, dark-polished wood. Narrow tables choked with books and instruments stood along a side of the chamber and at the far end I saw a deep cushioned couch with a heavy dome-shaped apparatus, like a beauty shop hair dryer, mounted at one end. I recognized it. It was a memory reinforcing machine, the first I had seen on Valen. I crossed the room and examined it. The last one I had seen, on the far voyager in the room near the library, had been a stark utility model. This was a deluxe job, with soft upholstery and bright metal fittings and more dials and idiot lights than a late-model Detroit status symbol. This solved one of the problems that had been hovering around the edge of my mind. I had fetched Foster's memory back to him, but without a machine to use it in it was just a tantalizing souvenir. Now all I had to do was sneak him away from Amadurid, make it back here. All of a sudden I felt tired vulnerable, helpless, and all alone. I had been taking wild chances, setting my head more and more brazenly into the kind of iron noose the big owner would arrange for his enemies, and without the ghost of a plan, without even the idea of what was going on. What was Amadurid's interest in Foster? Why did he hide away here, keeping the rest of Valen away with rumors of magic and spells? What connection did he have with the disaster that had befallen the two worlds, now reduced to one and a poor one at that? And why was I, a plain Joe named Legion, mixed up in it right to the eyebrows, when I could be sitting safe at home in a clean federal pen? The answer to that last one wasn't too hard to recite. I had had a pal once, a smooth character named Foster who had pulled me back from the ragged edge just when I was about to make a bigger mistake than usual. He had been a gentleman in the best sense of the word, and he had treated me like one. Together we had shared a strange adventure 
that had made me rich and had showed me that it was never too late to straighten your back and take on whatever the fates handed out. I had come running his way when trouble got too thick back home, and I'd found him in a worse spot than I was in. He had come back, after the most agonizing exile a man had ever suffered, to find his world fallen back into savagery, and his memory still eluding him. Now he was in chains, without friends and without hope, but still not broken, still standing on his own two feet. But he was wrong on one point. He had one little hope. Not much, just a hard-luck guy with a penchant for bad decisions. But I was here, and I was free. I had my pistol on my hip and a neat back way into the owner's bedroom. And if I played it right, and watched my timing, and had maybe just a little luck, say about the amount it took to hit the Irish sweepstakes, I might bring it off yet. Right now it was time to return to my crawl space. Almadurid might come back and talk some more, tip me off to a vulnerable spot in the armor of his fortress. I went to the door, flicked off the light, turned the handle, and went frigid. Almadurid was back. He pulled off the purple cloak, tossed it aside, strode to a wall bar. I clung to the crack of the door, not daring to move even close to it. "'But, my lord!' the voice of the redhead said. "'I know he remembers!' "'Not so,' Amadurid's voice rumbled. "'On the morrow I strip his mind to the bare clean jelly.' "'Let me, dread lord. With my steel I'll have the truth from him.' Such a one as he your steel has never known," the bass voice snarled. "'Great owner, I crave but one hour. Tomorrow, in the ceremonial chamber, I shall environ him with the emblems of the past. Enough!' Amadur's fist slammed against the bar, made glasses jump. "'On such starveling lackwits as you a mighty empire hangs. It is a crime before the gods, and on his head I lay it. The owner tossed off a glass, jerked his head at the cowering man. Still, I grant thy boon. Now begone, babbler of folly. The redhead ducked, grinning, disappeared. Amadurid muttered to himself, strode up and down the room, stood staring out into the night. He noticed the open balcony door, pulled it shut with a curse. I held my breath, but no general check of doors followed. The big man threw off his clothes then. He clambered up on the wide couch, touched a switch somewhere, and the room was dark. Within five minutes I heard the heavy breathing of deep sleep. I had found out one thing, anyway. Tomorrow was Foster's last day. One way or another, Amadurid and the redhead between them would destroy him. That didn't leave much time. But since the project was already hopeless, it didn't make much difference. I had a choice of moves now. I could tiptoe across to the register and try to wiggle through it without waking up the brontosaurus on the bed. Or I could try for the balcony door a foot from where he slept. Or I could stay put and wait him out. The last idea had the virtue of requiring no immediate daring adventures. I could just curl up on the floor, or better still, on the padded couch. A weird idea was taking shape in my mind, like a genie rising from a bottle. I felt in my pocket, pulled out the two small cylinders that represented two men's memories of hundreds of years of living. One belonged to Foster, the one with the black and gold bands, but the other was the property of a stranger who had died three thousand years ago out in space. This cylinder, barely three inches long, held all the memories of a man who had been Foster's confidant when he was Cool Clan, a man who knew what had happened aboard the ship, what the purpose of the expedition had been, and what conditions they had left behind on Valon. I needed that knowledge. I needed any knowledge I could get, to add a featherweight to my side of the balance when the showdown came. The cylinder would tell me plenty, including possibly the reason for Amadurid's interest in Foster. It was simple to use. I merely placed the cylinder in the receptacle in the side of the machine, took my place, lowered the helmet into position, and in an hour or so 
I would awaken with another man's memory stored in my brain, to use as I saw fit. It would be a crime to waste the opportunity. The machine I had found here was probably the only one still in existence on Valon. I had blundered my way into the one room in the palace that could help me in what I had to do. I had been lucky. I couldn't waste that luck. I went across to the soft cushioned chair, spotted the recess in its side, and thrust the plain cylinder into it. It seated with a click. I sat on the couch, lay back, reached up to pull the headpiece down into position against my skull. There was an instant of pain, like a prefrontal lobotomy performed without anesthetic. Then blackness. End of chapter 17《Chapter 18 of A Trace of Memory by Keith Lawmer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Trace of Memory Chapter 18 I stood beside the royal couch where Quolquan the Urther lay, and saw that this was the hour for which I had waited long for the change was on him. The time-scale stood at the third hour of the death-watch. All aboard slept save myself alone. I must move swiftly and at the dawn-watch show them the deed well done. I shook the sleeping man, him who had once been the earther, king no more, by the law of change. He wakened slowly, looked about him, with the clear eyes of the newborn. Rise. I commanded, and the king obeyed. "'Follow me,' I said. He made to question me, after the manner of those newly awakened from their change. I bade him be silent. Like a lamb he came, and I led him through shadowed ways to the cage of the hunters. They rose, keen in their hunger, to my coming, as I had trained them. I took the arm of Kulklan and thrust it into the cage. The hunters clustered taking the mark of their prey. He watched, innocent eyes wide. "'That which you feel is pain, mindless one,' I spoke. "'It is a thing of which you will learn much in the time before you.' Then they had done, and I set the time-catch. In my chambers I cloaked the innocent in a plain purple robe and afterward led him to the cradle where the lifeboat lay and by the virtue of the curse of the gods which is upon me, one was there before me. I waited not, but moved as the hake strikes, and took him fair in the back with my dagger. I dragged the body into hiding behind the flared foot of a column. But no sooner was he hidden well away than others came from the shadows, summoned by some device I know not of. They asked of the earther wherefore he walked by night, robed in the colors of a maron of Bros Iliand and I knew black despair that my grand design foundered thus in the shallows of their zeal. Yet I spoke forth, with a great show of anger, that I, Amaron, vizier and companion to the earther, did but walk and speak in confidence with my liege lord. But they persisted, Golad foremost among them. And then one saw the hidden course and in an instant they ringed me in. Then did I draw the long blade and hold it at the throat of Quolclan. "'Press me not, or your king will surely die,' I said, and they feared me and shrank back. "'Do you dream that I, Ameron, wisest of the wise, have come here for the love of far voyaging?' I raged. "'Long have I plotted against this hour, to lure this king a-voyaging in this his princely yacht, his faithful vizier at his side.' that the change might come to him far from his court. Then would the ancient wrong be redressed. There are those men born to rule, as the dream-tree seeks the sun, and such a one am I. Long has this one, now mindless, denied to me my destiny. But behold, I, with a stroke, shall set things aright. Below us lies a green world, peopled by savages. 
Not one am I to take blood vengeance on a man newborn from the change. Instead, I shall set him free to take up his life there below. May the fates lead him again to royal state, if that be their will." But there were naught but fools among them, and they drew steel. I cried out to them that all, all should share. But they heeded me not, but rushed upon me. Then did I turn to Qualcon and drive the long blade at his throat, but Goldad threw himself before him and fell in his place. Then they pressed me, and I did strike out against three who hemmed me close, and though they took many wounds they persisted in their madness, one leaping in to strike and another at my back, so that I whirled and slashed at shadows who danced away. In the end I hunted them down in those corners whither they had dragged themselves and each did I put to the sword. And I turned at last to find the earther gone, and some few with them, and madness took me that I had been gulled like a tinker by common men. In the chamber of the memory couch would I find them. There they would seek to give back to the mindless one that memory of past glories which I had schemed so long to deny him. Almost I wept to see such cunning wasted. Terrible in my wrath I came upon them there. There were but two, and though they stood shoulder to shoulder in the entryway, their poor dirks were no match for my long blade. I struck them dead and went to the couch, to lay my hand on the cylinder marked with the vile golden black of Kulklan, that I might destroy it, and with it the earther, for ever. And I heard a sound and whirled about. A hideous figure staggered to me from the gloom, and for an instant I saw the flash of steel in the bloody hand of the accursed Golad, whom I had left for dead. Then I knew cold agony between my ribs. Golad lay slumped against the wall, his face greenish above the blood-soaked tunic. When he spoke, air whistled through his slashed throat. "'Have done, traitor, who once was honor of the king,' he whispered. "'Have you no pity for him who once ruled in justice and splendor at high Auk Hameloth? "'Had you not robbed me of my destiny, murderous dog?' I croaked that splendor would have been mine." "'You came upon him helpless,' gasped Golad. "'Make some amends now for your shame. Let the earther have his mind, which is more precious than his life. I but rest to gather strength. Soon will I rise and turn him from the couch. Then will I die content. Once you were his friend. Goldad whispered. By his side you fought, when both of you were young. Remember that, and have pity. To leave him here, in this ship of death, mindless and alone. I have loosed the hunters, I shrieked in triumph. With them will the earther share this tomb until the end of time. Then I searched within me, and found a last terrible strength, and I rose up and even as my hand reached out to pluck away the mind-trace of the king, I felt the bloody fingers of Golad on my ankle, and then my strength was gone. And I was falling headlong into that dark well of death from which there is no returning. I woke up and lay for a long time in the dark without moving, trying to remember the fragments of a strange dream of violence and death. I could still taste the lingering dregs of some bitter emotion but I had more important things to think about than dreams. For just a moment I couldn't remember what it was I had to do, then with a start I remembered where I was. I had lain down on the couch and pulled a headpiece into place. It hadn't worked. I thought hard, trying to tap a new reservoir of memories, drew a blank. Maybe my earth mind was too alien for the Valonian memory trace to affect. It was another good idea that hadn't worked out. But at least I had had a good rest. Now it was time to get moving. First, to see if Amadurid was still asleep. I started to sit up. Nothing happened. I had a moment of vertigo, as my inner ear tried to accommodate to having stayed in the same place after automatically adjusting to my intention of rising. I lay perfectly still and tried to think it through. I had tried to move, 
and hadn't so much as twitched a muscle. I was paralyzed, or tied up, or maybe, if I was lucky, imagining things. I could try it again, and next time. I was afraid to try. Suppose I tried and nothing happened, again. It was better to lie here and tell myself it was all a mistake. Maybe I should go back to sleep and wake up later and try it again. This was ridiculous. All I had to do was sit up. I... Nothing. I lay in the dark and tried to will an arm to move, my head to turn. It was as though I had no arm, no head, just a mind, alone in the dark. I strained to sense the ropes that held me down. Still nothing. No ropes, no arms, no body. There was no pressure against me from the couch, no vagrant itch or cramp, no physical sensation. I was a disembodied brain, lying nestled in a great bed of pitch-black cotton wool. Then, abruptly, I was aware of myself. Not the gross mechanism of bone and muscle, but the neuroelectric field generated within a brain alive with flashing currents and a lightning interplay of molecular forces. A sense of orientation grew. I occupied a block of cells, here in the left hemisphere. The mass of neural tissue loomed over me, gigantic. And I, I was reduced to the elemental ego, who possessed as a material appurtenance my arms and legs, my body, my brain. Relieved of outside stimuli, I was able now to conceptualize myself as I actually was, an insubstantial state existing in an immaterial continuum, created by the action of neural currents within the cerebrum, as a magnetic field is created in space by the flow of electricity. And I knew what had happened. I had opened my mind to invasion by alien memories. The other mind had seized upon the sensory centers and driven me to this dark corner. I was a fugitive within my own skull. For a timeless time I lay stunned, immured now as the massive stones of Bar Ponderone had never confined me. My basic self-awareness still survived, out was shunted aside, cut off from any contact with the body itself. With shadowy fingers of imagination I clawed at the wall surrounding me, fought for a glimpse of light, for a way out. And found none. Then at last I began again to think. I must analyze my awareness of my surroundings, seek out channels through which impulses from sensory nerves flowed, and tapped them. I tried cautiously. An extension of my self-concept reached out with ultimate delicacy. There were the ranked infinities of cells, there the rushing torrents of gross fluid, there the taut cables of the interconnecting web, and there... Barrier. Blank and impregnable, the wall reared up. My questing tendril of self-stuff raced over the surface like an ant over a melon, and found no tiniest fissure. It loomed alien, inscrutable. The invader who had stolen my brain. I withdrew. To dissipate my force was senseless. I must select a point of attack, hurl against it all the power of my surviving identity before it too dwindled away and the abstraction that was legion vanished forevermore. The last of the phantom emotions that had clung, for how long, to the incorporeal minefield had faded now, leaving me with no more than an intellectual determination to reassert myself. Dimly I recognized this sign of my waning sense of identity, but there was no surge of instinctive fear. Instead I coolly assessed my resources and almost at once stumbled into an unused channel, here within my own self-field. For a moment I recoiled from the outre configuration of the stored patterns, and then I remembered. I had been in the water, struggling, while the red soldier waited, rifle aimed. And then a flood of data, flowing with cold, impersonal precision. And I had deftly marshaled the forces of my body to survive. And once more, as I hung by numbed fingers under the cornice of the Jordano building, 
the cold voice had spoken. And I had forgotten. The miracle had been pushed back, rejected by the conscious mind. But now I knew. This was the knowledge that I had received from the background briefing device that I had used in my island strongroom before I fled. This was the survival data known to all old Valonians of the days of the two worlds. It had lain here unused, the secrets of superhuman strength and endurance, buried by the imbecile of censor self's aversion to the alien. But the ego alone remained now, stripped of the burden of neurosis, freed from the subconscious pressures. The levels of the mind were laid bare, and I saw close at hand the regions where dreams were born, the barren sources of instinctive fear patterns, the linkages to blinding emotions, and all lay now under my overt control. Without further hesitation I tapped the stored Valonian knowledge, encompassed it, made it mine. Then again I approached the barrier, spread out across it, probed in vain. Vile, primitive! The thought thundered out with crushing force. I recoiled, then renewed my attack, alert now. I knew what to do. I sought and found a line of synaptic weakness, burrowed at it. Intolerable! Vestigial! Erasure! I struck instantly, slipped past the shield, laid firm hold on an optic receptor bank. The alien mind threw itself against me, but too late. I held secure, and the assault faded, withdrew. Cautiously, I extended my interpretive receptivity. There was a pattern of pulses, oscillations in the Lambda Mu range. I tuned, focused. Abruptly, I was seeing. For a moment, my fragile equilibrium tottered, as I strove to integrate the flow of external stimuli into my bodiless self-concept. Then a balance was struck. I held my ground and stared through the one eye I had recaptured from the usurper. And I reeled again. Bright daylight blazed in the chamber of Amadurid. The scene shifted as the body moved about, crossing the room, turning. I had assumed that the body still lay in the dark, but instead it walked, without my knowledge, propelled by a stranger. The field of vision flashed across the couch. Amadurid was gone. I sensed that the entire left lobe, disoriented by the loss of the eye, had slipped now to secondary awareness, its defenses weakened. I retreated momentarily from my optic outpost, laid a temporary traumatic block across the access nerves to keep the intruder from reasserting possession, and concentrated my force in an attack on the auricular channels. It was an easy route. Instantly, my eye coordinated its impressions with those coming in along the oral nerves, and heard my voice mouth a curse. The body was standing beside a bare wall with a hand laid upon it. In the wall a recess partly obscured by a sliding panel stood empty. The body turned, strode to a doorway, emerged into a gloomy, violet-shadowed corridor. The glance flicked from the face of one guard to another. They stared in open-mouthed surprise, brought weapons up. "'You dare to bar the path of the Lord Amerum?' my voice slashed at the men. "'Stand aside, as you value your lives!' And the body pushed past them, striding off along the corridor. It passed through a great archway, descended a flight of marble stairs, came along a hall I had seen on my tour of the Palace of Sapphires, and into the onyx chamber with the great golden sunburst that covered the high black wall. In the great owner's chair at the ring-board Amadurid sat scowling at the lame courtier whose red hair was hidden now under a black cowl. Between them Foster stood, the heavy manacles dragging at his wrists. Amadurid turned, his face paled, then flushed darkly. He rose, teeth bared. The gaze of my eye fixed on Foster. Foster stared back, a look of incredulity growing on his face. "'My Lord Earther,' I heard my voice say. The eye swept down and fixed on the manacles. The body drew back a step, as if in horror. "'You overreach yourself, Amadurid!' my voice cried harshly. Amadurid stepped toward me, his immense arm raised. 
Lay not a hand on me, dog of a usurper! my voice roared out. By the gods, would you take me for common clay? And unbelievably, Amadurid paused, stared in my face. I know you as the upstart dragon, Betty Owner, he rumbled, but I know I see another there behind your pale eyes. Foul was the crime that brought me to this pass, my voice said, but know that your master, Amaron, stands before you, in the body of a primitive. Amaron! Amadura jerked as though he had been struck. My body turned, dismissing him. The eye rested on Foster. My liege, my voice said unctuously, I swear the dog dies for this treason. It is a mindless one, intruder, Amadura broke in. Seek no favor with the earther, for he that was earther is no more. You deal with me now. My body whirled on Amadurid. Give a thought to your tone, lest your ambitions prove your death. Amadurid put a hand to his dagger. A maron of Bros Ilion you may be, or a changeling from dark regions I know not of, but know that this day I hold all power in Valon. And what of this one who was once Qualquan? What consort do you hold with him you say is mindless? I saw my hand sweep out in a contemptuous gesture at Foster. "'An end to patience!' the great owner roared. "'Shall I stand in my inner citadel and give account of myself to a madman?' He started toward my body. "'Does the fool Amadurid forget the power of the great Amaron?' my voice said softly. And the towering figure hesitated once more, searching my face. The earther's hour is past, and yours, bungler and fool, my voice went on. Your months, or is it years, of self-delusion are ended. My voice rose in a bellow. Know that I, Amaron the Great, have returned to rule at High Ock Hemeloth. Months? rumbled Amadurid. Indeed, I believe the tales of the Grey Men are true and that an evil spirit has returned to haunt me. You speak of months?" He threw back his head, laughed a choked throaty laugh that was half sob. No, demon or madman or ancient prince of evil, for thirty centuries have I brooded alone, sealed from an empire by a single key. I felt the shock wreck through and through the invader mind. This was the opportunity I had hoped for. Quick as thought I moved, slashed at the wavering shield, and was past it. I grappled onto the foul mind-matrix, scanned its symbolisms. A miasma of twisted concepts, like great webs, a squirm with bristling nodes like crouching spiders, and through it all a yammering torrent of deformed thought-shapes. In my eagerness I was careless. The invader mind, recovering, struck back. Too late I felt it slip into my awareness, flick over the stored information. I leaped to protect one fact, and lost my gains. With only a single tenuous line of rapport with the alien mind still open, I clung, shaken, but hugging precious patterns of stolen data. My raid had been no more than an irritation to the other mind, but I had fetched away a mass of information. I interpreted it, integrated it, matched it to known patterns. A complex structure of relationships evolved, growing into a new awareness. Upon the mind-picture of Foster's face was now superimposed another, that of Kulklon, Earther of all Valon, ruler of the two worlds. And other pictures, snatched from the intruder mind, were present now in the Earth consciousness of me, Legion. The vaults, deep in the rock under the fabled city of Ak Hemeloth, where the mind-trace of every citizen was stored, sealed by the earther and keyed to his mind alone. Amaron, urging the king to embark on a far voyage, stressing the burden of government, tempting him to bring with him the royal mind-trace. Kalklan's acquiescence and Amaron's secret joy at the advancement of his scheme, the coming of the change for the earther, aboard ship, far out in space, 
and the vizier's bold stroke, and then the fools who found him at the lifeboat, and the loss of all, all. There my own memories took up the tale, the awakening of Foster, unsuspecting, and his recording of the mind of the dying Ameron, the flight from the hunters, the memory trace of the king that lay for three millennia among Neolithic bones until I, a primitive, plucked it from its place, and the pocket of a coarse fibre garment where the cylinder lay now, on the hip of the body I inhabited, but as inaccessible to me as if it had been a million miles away. But there was a second memory trace, Ameron's. I had crossed a galaxy to come to Foster, and with me, locked in an unmarked pewter cylinder, I had brought Foster's ancient nemesis. I had given it life and a body. Foster, once Earther, had survived against all logic and had come back, back from the dead, the last hope of a golden age, to meet his fate at my hands. Three thousand years, I heard my voice saying, three thousand years have the men of Valon lived mindless, with the glory that was Valon locked away in a vault without a key. I alone, said Amadurid, have borne the curse of knowledge. Long ago, in the days of the Earther, I took my mind trace from the vaults in anticipation of the day of days when he should fall. Little joy has it brought me. And now, my voice said, you think to force this mind, that is no mind, to unseal the vault? I know it for a hopeless task, Amadurid said. At first I thought, since he speaks the tongue of old Valen, that he dissembled. But he knows nothing. This is but the dry husk of the earther, and I sicken of the sight. I would fain kill him now and let the long farce end. Not so, my voice cut in. Once I decreed exile to the mindless one, so be it. The face of Amadurid twisted in its rage. Your witless chatterings, too! I tire of them!" Wait, my voice snarled. Would you put aside the key? There was silence as Amadurid stared at my face. I saw my hand rise into view. Gripped in it was Foster's memory trace. The two worlds lie in my hand, my voice spoke. Observe well the black and golden bands of the royal memory trace who holds this key is all-powerful. As for the mindless body yonder, let it be destroyed." Amadurid locked eyes with mine. Then, "'Let the deed be done,' he said. The redhead drew a long stiletto from under his cloak, smiling. I could wait no longer. Along the link I had kept through the intruder's barrier, I poured the last of the stored energy of my mind. I felt the enemy recoil then strike back with crushing force. But I was past the shield. As the invader reached out to encircle me, I shattered my unified forward impulse into myriad nervous streamlets that flowed on, under, over and around the opposing force. I spread myself through and through the inner all-mass, drawing new power from the trunk sources. I caught a vicious blast of pure wrath that rocked me and then I grappled, shield to shield with the alien. And he was stronger. Like a corrosive fluid the massive personality gestalt shredded my extended self-field. I drew back slowly, reluctantly. I caught a shadowy impression of the body, standing rigid, eyes blank, and sensed a rumbling voice that spoke, "'Quick! The intruder!' Now I struck for the right optic center, clamped down with a death-grip. The enemy mind went mad as the darkness closed in. I heard my voice scream and I saw in vivid pantomime the vision that threatened the invader. The red head darting to me, the stiletto flashing. And then the invading mind broke, swirled into chaos and was gone. I reeled, shocked and alone inside my skull. The brain loomed, dark and untenanted now. I began to move crept along the major nerve paths, reoccupied the cortex. Agony! I twisted, felt again with a massive return of sensation my arms, my legs, 
open both eyes to see blurred figures moving, and in my chest a hideous pain. I was sprawled on the floor, gasping. Sudden understanding came. The redhead had struck, and the other mind, in full rapport with the pain centers, had broken under the shock, left the stricken brain to me alone. As through a red veil I saw the giant figure of Amadurid loom, stoop over me, rise with the royal cylinder in his hand, and beyond Foster, strained backward, the chain between his wrists garroting the redhead. Amadurid turned, took a step, flicked the man from Foster's grasp and hurled him aside. He drew his dagger. Quick as a hunting cat, Foster leaped, struck with the manacles, and the knife clattered across the floor. Amadurid backed away with a curse, while the redhead seized the stiletto he had let fall and moved in. Foster turned to meet him, staggering, and raised heavy arms. I fought to move, got my hand as far as my side, fumbled with the leather strap. The alien mind had stolen from my brain the knowledge of the cylinder, but I had kept from it the fact of the pistol. I had my hand on its butt now. Painfully I drew it, dragged my arm up struggled to raise the weapon, centered it on the back of the mop of red hair, free now of the cowl, and fired. Amadurid had found his dagger. He turned back from the corner where Foster had sent it spinning. Spattered with the blood of the redhead, Foster retreated until his back was at the wall. A haggard figure against the gaudy golden sunburst. The flames of beaten metal shimmered and flared before my dimming vision the great gold circles of the two worlds seemed to revolve, while waves of darkness rolled over me. But there was a thought, something I had found among the patterns in the intruder's mind. At the center of the sunburst rose a boss, in black and gold, erupting a foot from the wall like a sword-hilt. The thought came from far away. The sword of the earther, used once, in the dawn of a world, by a warrior king but laid away now, locked in its sheath of stone, keyed to the mind-pattern of the earther, that none other might ever draw it to some ignoble end. A sword, keyed to the basic mind-pattern of the king. I drew a last breath, blinked back the darkness. Amadurd stepped past me, knife in hand toward the unarmed man. Foster! I croaked. The sword! Foster's head came up. I had spoken in English. The syllables rang strangely in that outworld setting. Amadurid ignored the unknown words. "'Draw the sword from the stone. Your Kull clan, Uther of Valen.' I saw him reach out, grasp the ornate hilt. Amadurid, with a cry, leaped toward him. The sword slid out smoothly, four feet of glittering steel. Amadurid stopped stared at the manacled hands gripping the hilt of the fabled blade. Slowly he sank to his knees, bent his neck. "'I yield, Kolklan, he said. "'I crave the mercy of the earther.' Behind me I heard thundering feet. Dimly I was aware of Torbu raising my head, a foster leaning over me. They were saying something, but I couldn't hear. My feet were cold, and the coldness crept higher. I felt hands touch me, and the cool smoothness of metal against my temples. I wanted to say something, tell Foster that I had found the answer, the one that had always eluded me before. I wanted to tell him that all lives are the same length when viewed from the foreshortened perspective of death, and that life, like music, requires no meaning but only a certain symmetry. But it was too hard. I tried to cling to the thought to carry it with me into the cold void toward which I moved, but it slipped away and there was only my self-awareness, alone in emptiness, and the winds that swept through eternity blew away the last shred of ego and I was one with darkness. End of chapter 18《Epilogue to a Trace of Memory》by Keith Lawmer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. A Trace of Memory Epilogue I awoke to a light like that of a morning when the world was young. Gossamer curtains fluttered at tall windows, through which I saw a squadron of trim white clouds riding in a high blue sky. I turned my head, and Foster stood beside me, dressed in a short white tunic. "'That's a crazy set of threads, Foster,' I said. "'But on your build it looks good. But you've aged. You look twenty-five if you look a day.' Foster smiled. "'Welcome to Valen, my friend,' he said in English. I noticed that he faltered a bit over the words, as if he hadn't used them for a long time. Valen, I said. Then it wasn't all a dream? Regarded as a dream, Legion, your life begins today. There was something, I said, something I had to do, but it doesn't seem to matter. I feel relaxed inside. Someone came forward from behind Foster. Gope, I said. Then I hesitated. You are Gope, aren't you? I said in Valonian. He laughed. I was known by that name once, he said, but my true name is Guan. My eyes fell on my legs. I saw that I was wearing a tunic like Foster's, except that mine was pale blue. Who put the dress on me? I asked. And where's my pants? This garment suits you better, said Gope. Come, look in the glass. I got to my feet, stepped to a long mirror, glanced at the reflection. It's not the real me, boys, I started. Then I stared open-mouthed. A Hercules, black-haired and clean-limbed, stared back. I shut my mouth, and his mouth shut. I moved an arm, and he did likewise. I whirled on Foster. What? How? Who? The mortal body that was legion died of its wounds, he said. But the mind that was the man was recorded. We have waited many years to give that mind life again. I turned back to the mirror, gaped. The young giant gaped back. I remember, I said. I remember a knife in my guts, and a red-headed man, and the great owner, and— For his crimes, told Gope, he went to a place of exile until the change should come on him. Long have we waited. I looked again, and now I saw two faces in the mirror, and both of them were young. One was low down, just above my ankles, and it belonged to a cat I had known as Itsenka. The other, higher up, was that of a man I had known as Amadurit. But this was a clear-eyed Amadurit, just under twenty-one. On to the blank slate we traced your mind, said Gope. He owed you a life, Legion, Foster said. His own was forfeit. I guess I ought to kick and scream and demand my original ugly puss back, I said slowly, studying my reflection. But the fact is, I like looking like Mr. Universe. Your earthly body was infected with the germs of old age, said Foster. Now you can look forward to a great span of life. But come, said Gope, all Valen waits to honor you. He led the way to the tall window. Your place is by my side at the great ring board, said Foster. And afterwards, all of the two worlds lie before you. I looked past the open window and saw a carpet of velvet green that curved over foothills to the rim of a forest. Down the long sward, I saw a procession of bright knights and ladies come riding on animals some black, some golden palomino, that looked all for the world like unicorns. My eyes traveled upward to where the light of a great white sun flashed on blue towers, and somewhere trumpets sounded. "'It looks like a pretty fair offer,' I said. "'I'll take it.'" The End of A Trace of Memory by Keith Lawmer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.